Welcome to lab nine. We're talking about the chi-square test and chi-square distributions. I've got a number of things I want to talk about, but I thought for this one, we'd just jump right into the first practical section and use the chi-square.test function from base R to do a few quick chi-square tests. Okay, so let's jump over here. As you know, you can use the uh, question mark in front of your function name and that'll bring up your help file over here. It's worth reading through this one because there's a lot of extra details to the main test. I'll briefly say that this function can take as an input a vector of frequency data or a matrix for a contingency table. And we'll see that it produces all the things associated with the chi-square test that you've been learning about in the lecture. There's a few other details, we won't really go into them, uh, but in this function, the author of the function added some extra things that you can do, including some Monte Carlo simulations to calculate p-values a different way than the normal way. And if you want to read about the extra stuff, you can scroll down in the help file and read about that in the details. Um, actually, that's a general rule for many R functions for statistical tests. If there's uh, Important details, sometimes it could be related to suggestions from authors in the statistics literature about which algorithms to use for what purposes for specific situations. And you'll see that the author of the R function has pointed to do those things in the help file. If you ever really, really want to know what a function is actually doing, you can type the name of the function into R just like this and press return and that will print out the function definition. And you can go through that and confirm uh, exactly what the function is doing. So in our case, we're gonna do two really quick things. And the first one is do a chi-square test on a frequency vector. So here's a really simple frequency vector. It's the number 20 and the number 30. And uh, this could be something like the result of flipping a coin 50 times and getting 20 heads and 30 tails. So that's a vector of two numbers. And if I pop that into the chi-square function and run it, I get this as an output. And we have here a chi-squared test for the given probabilities. Uh, we have a chi-square of two degrees of freedom, one on this one. And the chi-squared value of two, uh, the p-value associated with this number on this chi-square distribution with the degrees of freedom of one is this value right here. It is possible, uh, so I should say by default, the assumption here is that um, if you have 50 total things, it's going to divide by the two um, outcomes and produce a 25 for each of the experiments are theoretically expected frequencies here. So it automatically does that for you. It's possible to specify different theoretical probabilities. So if we had a coin that was biased towards the, um, what we're saying, the tails, we could do this as well. And then even though we put in the very same observed frequencies, the theoretical frequencies would be calculated as different and the chi-square value would be different. And so here, uh, we get a different chi-square value. Uh, I'll also note that the number of values we can put in our vector can be any number. So here would be for rolling a dice, say 120 times. I just made up some numbers. These are the frequency counts potentially associated with rolling a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And if I put these in my vector and then run the chi-square, I'll get my chi-square value. And in this case, the appropriate chi-square distribution has a degrees of freedom of five because there's six minus one um, independent numbers that are free to vary. If the total has to sum up to 120, um, we've estimated the sum, that's one property of this set of numbers that we've estimated. So there's six total numbers, that means that five of them could be any number, and the last one would have to be a specific number, 
in order to get to 120. Finally, uh, we can input matrices or tables of frequency values to this function. Um, this part here is an example of doing that, and it's taken from the help file right at the bottom. Uh, not quite at the bottom, right at the top. There it's out. And actually, I didn't look what this is from, but apparently this is from Agresti 2007 on page 39, some example here. And this is nice. I'm assuming this is some type of textbook or potentially a paper where these numbers were used to do a chi-square test and uh, presumably the results that we're going to see here would match up with that example. And what's going on here, the first two lines, they just produce a matrix or a table. And in this case, we have some frequency counts uh, divided by gender for different political affiliations, I guess, or potentially votes, or who knows what these numbers actually represent. And if we, so this is d defined as M, uh, if we just put M inside of the chi-square test, just like this, we're going to run the chi-square test on that matrix. If we assign it to a variable, then we'll see that the chi-square test actually produces a list, and there's a bunch of different things in the variable that we can get access to. Notice this line here, it has parentheses around the whole thing. And when you do that, it prints it, prints the output as well as saves the contents of this test in this variable. So this line 92 has two actions, saving the results in this variable, as well as printing the results to the console. And that's actually pretty convenient. I don't do that very often, but I should start doing that more often. Because if we didn't have that and I wanted to run this, it would run, but I wouldn't see the output. I wouldn't see what was printed. So I can do this and do both at the same time. Um, all right, so if we were to look at this table, um, we could see a bunch of things that needs to that need to go into the chi-square test. So for example, the chi-square test needs the observed frequencies, and that's what we're seeing, that's what's provided in this matrix, but it becomes a property in our variable storing the results of the test under x, sq, dollar sign, observed. And so that just shows you those numbers. It also shows you the expected values. So these are calculated for you uh, we're in later on in the lecture here, or in the lab, sorry, uh, we will run through an example of calculating out the columns and the rows here. There's also the residuals, and so that's the differences between the observed and expected. And there's standardized residuals. See, those are all components of a chi-square test that you could use. There's more in there, so you can, let's see, press X, S, Q, dollar sign, and we can take out um, the p-value if we wanted that was calculated. We can take out the chi-square value, and so on. So <clears throat> if you already know what a chi-square test is and you know what its use is and you just want to run it in R, all you need is a vector of frequency numbers or uh, frequency data or a, a contingency table. And the number of rows or columns in that table could be uh, any number. You just pop it in here and you'll run that chi-square test. So let's just focus on this one example here a little bit. Uh, so we've done a chi-square test on that contingency table. We got, in this case, a chi-square sample statistic of 30.07. The degrees of freedom for the distribution here is 2. And that's because there is uh, 
two values in that table that are free to vary. And we'll talk about degrees of freedom a little bit later in the lab. And um, if you look up this value, 30, on a chi-square distribution with k equals 2 or degrees of freedom equals 2, you will find the probability of obtaining this value or larger is this one right here. Okay. Um, so this is what you get. And the goal of the rest of the lab is to use R to help us firm up our conceptual understanding of these different components. So the first way I want to do that is talk about our um, chi-square as three different things. And this is potentially one way in which the chi-square is a little bit confusing. So there's a chi-square distribution, there's a chi-square sample statistic, and there are different kinds of chi-square tests. Simply, the chi-square distribution is related to the standard normal or unit normal distribution. It is the sum of squared values from that distribution. And we will spend a, a bit of time thinking about what this means so that we have a clear understanding of chi-square distributions. The chi-square sample statistic, it's a formula that can be applied to frequency data. And this formula summarizes the amount by which some observed frequencies differ from theoretically expected frequencies. And this is a formula that Carl Pearson obtained. And finally, chi-square statistical tests, uh, there's different names for them. One of them is the test of independence. Um, sometimes we're also called a goodness of fit test. And these tests involve computing chi-square sample statistics on some obtained frequency data and then using properties of chi-square distributions as they relate to frequency data to make inferences about a null hypothesis. So let's talk about the sample statistic and distribution and uh, a little bit more closely. So first of all, we have the sample statistic. And I've just written two ways of writing this. Uh, the basic idea is that you're going to have some frequencies that you have obtained. Your data is some frequencies. So it could be from a coin flip. Uh, that's our example here. And what you're going to do for each frequency is you're going to make a subtraction between the frequency you got and the frequency you expected. And we're going to square that value and divide by the expected value. Do that for each of them, add them all up to get a, a, a value called chi-square. So just to walk through that, if we were to, say, flip a coin 50 times, and in this uh, data frame, what I've done is just said, let's say we do that, and we happen to get 23 heads and 27 tails. So I made a little table to show that outcome. And my observed values are 23 and 27. And I've just lined up here uh, the values I expect if the coin was fair. So if the coin would be 50-50 heads or tails, we would expect on average there to be 25 heads and 25 tails. So we've got some numbers. Um, finally, what I do here is just walk through the various steps of computing this formula. Uh, so we have a difference between our obtained and expected value. In this case, it's a minus 2. And in this case, it's a plus 2. We're going to square those values. And then we're going to divide by the expected value. So 4 divided by 25 is 0.16. 4 divided by 25 is 0.16. And finally, we're going to add up these values. So if we add them up, we get a 0.32. And that is the chi-square value for this situation. Here's a faster way to do it. If I just had the values uh, 23 and 27 in a vector O and 25 and 25 in the vector E, 
I could write a formula like this, where what I'm doing is saying, okay, subtract uh, e from o here, and then square those values, divide them all by e, and then just add them all up. And so that's kind of a one-liner, you get 0.32. Or you could just put your obtained values in the chi square test function, and it will calculate the chi-squared value for you, 0.32. So there's three different ways to do it in R. Um, what else do we have here? All right. Um, just want to point out that this number, it reflects the, it's a measure of the sum or total amount of differences between observed frequencies and expected frequencies, right? So if we had values 25 and 25, there'd be no difference between what we observed and what we'd expected. These numbers would all be zero. And so the chi-squared would be zero because if you add up a bunch of zeros, you get a zero. Once the differences get larger and larger and larger, so in this final example, I have a 47 and a three. So if we got 47 heads and three tails, that would be a large departure from what we expected. The differences would be large, the squared differences would be large and the normalized squared differences would still be large and if you add them all up you'd get a big number. So I'm just showing you here when the differences are not very big you get a small chi-squared but when the differences are very big you get a much larger chi-squared. Um, all right so that's the basic idea of the chi-square sample statistic. The next thing we're on about is the chi-square distribution. In some sense, the chi-square distribution is a totally different kind of beast. It is just a normal distribution squared, specifically a unit normal distribution. So what I'm showing you right here is a normal distribution, one that we're all familiar with. I've just uh, sampled 10,000 numbers using the R norm function, and I sampled it from a normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And we can see it looks like a normal distribution. So what I'm telling you is that the chi-square distribution is just this distribution squared. That is when k equals one. Uh, I should mention that the chi-square distribution is a family of distributions that depend on k. And we'll get to that in a second. So when k is 1, the definition of a chi-squared distribution is a normal distribution squared, or a unit normal distribution squared, and I've plotted that here. So what I've done is actually I've just taken random 10,000 random samples from a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1, and I squared all those values. So that would make all the negative values over on this side, positive, and it's going to square all of the values. And this is what that looks like. Kind of looks like an exponential function. So that is a chi-square distribution. It turns out that the properties of these distributions, that is squared unit normal distributions, which are chi-square distributions, are useful in statistics. Uh, there are, just like there are functions for the normal distribution in R, there are distribution, probability, quantile, and random deviate sampling functions for chi-square as well. Um, they're sort of interchangeable with the normal as long as you are squaring a unit normal distribution. So for example, I made this chi-square distribution by sampling random numbers from the normal distribution and squaring them. And I'm showing you here that instead of that, I could make a similar looking distribution by using the r chi-square function. 
and sampling 10,000 random numbers from that with a degrees of freedom of one. So these two are the same distribution. All right, so I'm pointing out that at the simplest with K1, chi-square is just a normal distribution squared. When K is greater than one, the chi-square distribution is defined like this. It is the sum of from one to K, which is the number of independent elements or the number of random deviates from a unit normal distribution squared. So here, ZI refers to independent samples from a unit normal distribution. So chi-square is the distribution of the sum of squared values from a unit normal distribution, and k is the number of independent samples in each sum. Now I'll flip over to r and play around with this a little bit. Uh, almost there. All right. So this is for k equals 1. We've already looked at this. What I did was I just did what I did before, but slightly differently, right? So if we do this, what we do is we generate one random number from a normal distribution. I've set this to 1. Previously, that was 10,000. Every time I do this, I'm squaring that value. So if I did this a bunch of times, we can just kind of see what it looks like to pull one random number from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one and square that value. We're always gonna get a positive value. So we're just looking really at numbers from a chi-square distribution. It'd be the same as doing this. And sampling one number from a chi-square distribution with a TF of one. Whoops, did I, R, chi, I need this S needs to be out of there. There we go. So that's the same thing. So here I'm generating 10,000 random deviates. Up here, I'm using the replicate function to redo this whole thing 10,000 times. It, it results in the same outcome of getting 10,000 random deviates from a normal that are squared. Um, but you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment. So first we make these two vectors of 10,000 numbers. I put them into a data frame and then I plot them and need to run ggplot. And I'm just showing you that the chi-square distribution with k equals one are just normal, uh, random deviates from a normal, a unit normal squared. And I've produced those random deviates from the chi-square function in R or from the normal distribution function squared. Here we go with k equals 2. So what's going on here? First of all, I could just set k to 2 in the R chi-square function and generate 10,000 new numbers and see what they look like. But what, what this involves is I think a little bit more clearly specified up here. So if we take a normal distribution, let's just do this part, and sample two numbers from it, and then we'd have to square those values. So let's do that. So I'm gonna redo my sample, sample two more and square those values. And then I need to add them up. So this little chunk right here, what it's doing is it's sampling two values from a normal, squaring them, and adding up the squares. They're always going to be positive numbers, and they're getting a little bit bigger this time. This is the process of sampling a value from a chi-square distribution with k equals 2. I've sampled two numbers from the normal, squared them, and summed them.
that's a chi-square with k equals 2. So if I did this 10,000 times, I could look at um, what that distribution would look like. So we do all those things. And here's what it looks like. Here's from the random deviates from the r chi-square function. And here's using the normal distribution, sampling two, squaring them, and summing them. And if you start thinking about what's going on here, the idea of a chi-square distribution is something like, is very abstract. Uh, if, if I took two numbers at random from a normal distribution, and I squared them both, and I added them up, and I got a number, what kind of number could that be? Well, you can imagine you could get a three and a negative one, square them and add them. You could get a one and a negative 0.5, square them and add them. You could get any combination of two numbers from a normal distribution, square them and add them. And the all the ways that that could work out and the probabilities of all of those things happening is what a chi-square distribution is when k is two. And if you go to k is three, now we're taking three numbers out, squaring them and summing them and looking at that value. We could do that here. So I've increased the number of numbers in here to three. And we can look at what that distribution uh, kind of, it starts having a hump to it. If we do five, now we're sampling five numbers out of a normal distribution, squaring them and summing them. It starts looking like this. It's shifting, the, the peak is shifting to the right. And, okay, here's a big piece of code where I'm using the D version of the chi-square function. This is the probability density function. And we're just gonna plot a bunch of different chi-square distributions from k equals 1 to 11. And uh, for number 1, remember it looked kind of like an exponential. And here's 3 and 5 and 9 and 11. And so as k increases, the uh, peak moves to the right. And the distribution gets flatter overall and more spread out across the range. Okay, what I want to do next is just help us think about some intuitions about what chi-squared distributions are. We've hinted at this. It's, you know, it's basically you start with k and that's how many numbers you're going to sample from a normal distribution. So if k is 11, you're going to take out 11 random numbers from a normal distribution, square them all, add them all up, and then you're going to get a value. And that's, uh, I mean, the question is, what could that value be? Well, it could be a whole bunch of different kinds of values, and they'll be distributed um, like this pinkish purple line here. That's a chi-square for 11. At some point, it's like, well, who cares about chi-square with different k's? I mean, why, why is it so important to think about taking one or three or five numbers from a normal distribution and square them and add them together? Well, before we talk about that, uh, let's just try to develop a few intuitions about chi-square. First of all, Let's say you randomly sample five numbers from a unit normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one, and then you square those numbers and then you add them all up, what would you expect that number to be? I guess we could kind of do that right here. We could say, well, let's take five numbers and square them and sum them and there's one example, and here's another example, and there's another example, and there's another. So, you know, what, what I expect the number to be, um, I guess my best expectation would be to think about uh, 
the distribution of all of these numbers. And I could put that into a variable. I could just sort of quickly generate 10,000 of these. And this isn't the proper distribution, but the simulated distribution. And I could look at it and I could see, oh, I see. So if I took five random numbers from a normal distribution, squared them and summed them, I, I'm going to get values that kind of range from zero and, okay, they're not, they're rarely bigger than 20, rarely bigger than 15, really. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So getting some idea of what I might expect. I haven't answered the question why I would care in the first place to have this kind of expectation. But I point out here that that distribution is just a chi-square distribution with k equals 5. So the, what you should expect uh, is defined by that chi-square distribution. Another question is, why does the chi-square distribution change shape as k increases? So if k was a big number like 60, what kind of shape would you expect? Um, or how about if you know what k is, what should you expect for the mean of the chi-square distribution? Uh, you should be able to have some pretty quick answers to these questions, and not based on math, but just based on understanding properties of chi-square. So for example, let's start with this. What is the mean of a unit normal distribution? Well, the definition of that is a mean of zero and a standard deviation one. So if we sampled 10,000 random numbers from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and standard deviation one, we should get a mean that's pretty close to the true mean. And we can see that that is close to zero. All right, well, what about chi-square? So if we did the same thing, take 10,000 random numbers out and squared them all, now you know we're taking all the negative values and make, turning them positive, and we're taking all the values and squaring them, what happens? Uh, it turns out that the mean of that distribution is one, or expected to be one. If I was to go back up here, so here's that chi-square distribution with k equals one. As you can see, most of the values are around zero, and they get um, much less likely as you get to about five. So the mean's gonna be somewhere around here, and that value happens to be one. All right, so what can we do with that information? We know that uh, the value of, um, the expected value, when you take a bunch of numbers out of a normal distribution and square them, um, the mean the mean is going to be 1. <laughs> so can we use this information to help us develop an intuition about chi-squares with uh, different numbers of k? So for example, um, what about a chi-square with k equals 10? If chi-square, uh, k equals 10. So what that means is you take 10 numbers out of a normal distribution, square them, sum them, and you do that a bunch of times, and you look at all the different kinds of numbers you could get. It's gonna be a shallow distribution, it's gonna be spread out. So lots of ways you could get a sum there. Let's just quickly figure out what is the mean of those. As you can see, it's close to 10. And does that make sense? Let's think about one way that uh, there's a quick way to realize that the k value for a chi-square distribution is the mean of that distribution. And we could think about it in terms of ones. So for example, when we have a first order chi-square distribution with k equals one, we know the mean of that distribution is one. We just figured that out up here. All right. All the rest of the chi-square distributions are basically just add, adding up different amounts of that first distribution. So if you have chi-square distribution of k equals two, what you're doing is you're 
right? You're getting a number from a normal, squaring it, getting another number from a normal and squaring it, and you're adding those things together. So we could think about your general expectation about what's going to happen each time. So in general, when you square one value from a unit normal distribution, the mean number is one. So in general, we expect that that first value is going to be a one. And then for the second thing, we have the very same expectation because for every time we sample a number from a distribution, the overarching expectation is we'll get the mean value. So we expect to get basically two ones on average. And if you add up two ones, you get a two. So for k equals two, uh, it's like thinking, well, I'll probably sample two ones. When k equals 10, you're basically saying, yeah, well, I'll probably, I'll be taking out 10 numbers, I'll be squaring them all, and a, each time I expect that number on average to be a one, because that's what happens on average. Um, and so I've got 10 of them, on average, I'll probably have a mean of 10. And so basically the k value for a chi-square distribution tracks the mean of that distribution. All right, so hopefully that uh, helped with a few intuitions it's about what this distribution is. The next thing we have to do is finish up our second concept section. And this turns to examine a little bit about why the chi-square test is used. So it turns out that, as we discussed in lecture, the binomial distribution converges on the normal distribution in the long run. And We've also discussed how chi-square distributions are related to normal distributions in terms of their sums of the squared values of unit normal distributions. And so it turns out that we can uh, relate chi-square distributions as approximating the properties of binomial distributions. Because in the long run, these things kind of get uh, averaged into a normal distribution. And what I wanted to do here was break down those ideas a little bit and try to illustrate them in R. So first of all, um, what I've done is created a histogram of a coin flip situation. So here we have a coin being flipped 10 times. It's a fair coin. And if you flip a coin 10 times, you could get zero heads all the way up to 10 heads. Uh, use the R binome function to flip this thing 10,000 times. And then I just counted up the occurrences of zero, one, two, three, and four, and so on. And uh, put it in histogram. So this is a discrete probability. This is an estimate of a discrete probability distribution. We could calculate these probabilities exactly, the probability of getting any one of these outcomes. We can also see that it kind of looks like a normal distribution, this binomial distribution. It certainly isn't a normal, it just kind of looks like one. And a normal distribution is continuous, it, uh, but a binomial distribution has discrete outcomes, so it's not continuous. This uh, distribution, this binomial distribution, it a approaches a normal distribution in the long run, um, especially when you increase the set here. That is, how, for example, how many times you're flipping that coin. So if we go and flip that coin 100 times instead of 10, there's a wider range of values. You can get anywhere from 0 to 100 heads. And these, again, are all discrete values that you could get in terms of number of heads. So I repeated this process 10,000 times just to get an idea of this distribution. And it has the appearance of a normal distribution. So if you keep going with this, uh, you will get distributions that approach normality. And, oops. So that's just an informal visual way 
of relating the binomial distribution to a normal distribution. Our purpose here is to develop a sense of the idea that the chi-square test is an approximation of the binomial test. And this is one of the reasons why uh, we'd be using a chi-square. So uh, basically, the let's, let's walk this through, check it out. So here we've got a coin flipping scenario. We've got a coin that's going to be flipped 10 times. And let's just say there's, uh, we've got two heads. So we could calculate the probability of getting an, a, an outcome as extreme as that. Um, we could do that for a two-tailed test. So that'd be like saying, what's the probability of getting two or less heads or eight or more heads? And because we've gone over the binomial test, we could just do this in R. Um, we could use the p-binome function, and we could say we're going to have uh, two successes out of 10 trials. The probability is 0.5. We'll set the lower tail to be true, so that will be uh, the probability of getting two or less. We get that probability. Then we multiply it by two because there's the complementary probability um, on the other side of that distribution. And so we've calculated the probability of getting two or less or eight or more as 0 0.109375. And these are analytic solutions. These are exact probabilities. If we were trying to figure out what the null hypothesis is in this situation, it's a fairly straightforward situation. And uh, the answer is obtained with a binomial test. We don't need another test for this. However, we could use a chi-square test as an approximation to the binomial. And let's just see uh, how that might be done. So first of all, uh, we could put our numbers 2 and 8 into the chi-square test function. And this would be equivalent to uh, this situation up here. And the chi-square value, you run that, you get a chi-square of 3.6. The degrees of freedom on this is a 1, because there's one value that's free to vary. If these are going to add up to 10 and one of them's 8, the other one has to be a specific number. And we calculate the p-value to be 0.05. So these p-values are kind of close, but they're really kind of far away as well. They're both relatively small, but this one is almost half the size as this one over here. So they're not bang on or anything like that. When the theoretical frequencies, so here in a chi-square test, the theoretical frequencies, if you flip a coin 10 times, would be five heads and five tails. Those are pretty small values. We're nowhere near in the long run in this situation. So the chi-square test doesn't really approximate the binomial very well because when we're dealing with these small frequencies, the binomial distribution um, is very different from a normal distribution. We have to increase these frequencies by quite a lot before they become like a normal distribution. And at that point, the probabilities that we get from the binomial test and the probabilities that we get from the chi-square test for specific situations will converge on each other because they're both estimating the same underlying normal distribution. And we can see that that happens a little bit by just testing some stuff out in R. So what I've gone and done here is I've increased the number of coin flips to 100 from 10. And I'm going to say, let's, let's look at the probability of getting 40 or less or 60 or more. And uh, we get 0 0.05688. The equivalent chi-squared test would be to use uh, 40 heads and 60 tails. And when we run that one, we get a p-value of 0.045. 
So the difference between the binomial p-value and the chi-square p-value is a little bit smaller now. It's not as big as this massive difference. Um, they're not quite the same. They're off by 0.01 or something like that. So let's go and make the theoretical frequencies even bigger. So for here, I increased the number of coin flips to 1,000. And we're looking at um, the probability of getting 450 or less or 550 or more. And it turns out that probability is 0 0.0017. If you put these values in a chi-square test, you get 0 0.0015. Now again, not the exact same, but the differences between these values are getting much smaller. If we went up to 10,000, uh, you can see the, the differences are getting pretty close. Sorry, the, the p-values are getting pretty close to each other. So this is just a quick and dirty way to use R to examine the idea that the chi-square test is going to be approximating the binomial test uh, because in the long run, they're estimating these same properties of normal distributions. All right, I'm going to go right back to the beginning, and I didn't even talk about this at the beginning of this lab, but I did a little bit of background here. Uh, you, I described a brief history of the chi-square test and uh, pointed to a few papers that are listed in the reference section here. So you can go and read Carl Pearson's 1900 paper where he talks about the chi-square test. It's quite a read. The math is very challenging. And uh, partly for that reason, you can also read, where is it? Um, Plackett from 1983. And he puts some of Carl Pearson's original words into an easier to digest format, talks about some of the context and historical background to the development of that test. Uh, I'll also point out that as we talk about Carl Pearson and his contemporaries, actually, for the rest of this course, uh, many of them were involved in the eugenics movement. And we've been alluding to these things in class a little bit. Um, so basically, Pearson uh, not only developed statistical techniques, but he also applied them to causes of the eugenics movement. That is a topic for another course, probably. And I'll just point out that interested readers could see examples of Pearson's publications on those topics in eugenics journals from the time. And I've also referred to a paper from 1958 that talks about some of these things here. Uh, Carl Pearson, a socialist and Darwinist. Um, okay. So I will also link to those papers somehow in this course. I'm thinking about developing a Zotero folder for everybody to access those things. More on that uh, tomorrow when we talk about this stuff. Next up is the generalization assignment where you've got the assignment of getting some open data from this paper and doing the same chi-square test that they did and seeing if you can get the same analyses.